Okay. So, as Sergio said, my name is Amit Kumar. I am a software craftsman, currently helping a bank in their digital transformation journey. Uh, you can find me on the internet uh, with this handle everywhere, to Amit. So, like I said, transformation journey in a bank is the topic that is most in interesting for people because banks are being disrupted by the ever, ever increasing demands of the customer. And if I think about it, has everyone seen this movie? How many of you have actually seen it? Okay, so the curious case of Benjamin Button. If you think about it, transformation in any large enterprise, including banks, is the same. In short, the story is about a kid which becomes younger as it grows, right? So large, in, large enterprises are actually similar. Any change in an enterprise, including banks, is slow because of the processes, regulations, governance requirements that make the change slow. However, and this is by design, banks are designed to be cost efficient and stable. And that's why these processes are there. And they have some sense to be there to actually be efficient and stable. But in the current era of digital, where everyone is saying that I want to be digital, things are changing at a very fast pace. Banks can no longer be doing just a savings, saving account business or a lending business. They have to change. They have to change the, the way they operate. They have to change the way they deliver software. So banks have to become more like an IT shop. Which means that they have to basically build new solutions. And the way I see most of the organization or large enterprises, what they have started to do is build beautiful interfaces for the customers via a web channel or mobile channel. But they fail to realize that if you build a Ferrari, you need that road to run the Ferrari. You have to change the core system as well. Which means if you have to build, run a beautiful software, you need to change the core systems. This does not mean that you have to change the whole core system. It's about achieving speed and efficiency, which means there's, there are certain things that you need to take care when you're actually doing the transformation journey. You need to change the way you build software, which is go away from the traditional software development uh, of waterfall and introduce agile. You, you need to change the cross, you need to bring more cross-functional culture, break the silos between business and IT, which means that business is no longer going to throw the BRD documents over the fence to IT to build it. It's more close collaboration. You need to get the skill set and the mindset, which we are going to talk about how do we, we are doing at the bank. Introduce DevOps and continuous delivery. And all of this beautiful things that you have heard. I'm not going to talk about the details because the, the focus of the, my talk is going to be around DevOps culture in, in BTPN. How many of, have, uh, of you have heard about BTPN? Anyone? One hand. No one else, okay. A quick introduction about BTPN. BTPN is a pretty old bank in Jakarta, established in 1958. Their core business has been national pension savings. They have been national pension savings bank. But over a period of time, they realized that they are being disrupted and they have to disrupt the way they do business. So in 2016, they launched a pure digital bank. And I, I, when I say pure digital bank, which is completely branchless, there is no branch of genius. I would strongly recommend to go and, and, and read about what genius is capable of doing. I think genius is mostly about the customer value proposition, a bank in, a, in your smartphone. Everything that you can do in a branch, you can do it on your smartphone. However, when we t when the, the, talk of, uh, the talk topic is DevOps culture. What do you think is a culture? Andrew was talking about CAMS, the DevOps culture, or the culture that requires to be built. But how do I know what is the right culture? What culture do I need to build in the organization? Every organization has its own way of living and breathing, which means you need to identify the culture of the organization and then change it. And this goes back to people and mindset. People have their mindset. Changing the mindset is the most hard thing that 
every human being can do. And it was very difficult for us as well to change the mindset and bring the culture of automation, bring the culture of engineering practices. The first thing that becomes very important where Agile Scrum helped us is to break the barriers or the silos of the organization, where we brought cross-functional teams together. We made business responsible for, for the ownership of what gets built. An IT team is responsible for the software, including the operations. So when you start to build the culture, you also need to take care of improvement. Continuous improvement is part of the cycle. When we say DevOps, you know, we, the, the fancy word is you build it, you run it. You break it, you fix it, right? But then when you say that statement, it is very, very easy. Ask a developer, how many of you are actually are actively developing? One, two. Have you ever run a software on production as a developer? OK, very good. It's not an easy task. As a developer, the mindset is always limited to the, the backlog story that is in front of you. And you will only be limited to that. You will not be thinking about how this software is going to run on production. Because the easiest thing is, hand it over to operations guy. I am responsible. I will do the automation. I will do the deployment. But how the software runs, I, I don't know how the software runs. Because it works on my local machine. It worked on SIT. It worked on UAT. But on production, if it fails, then there is environment leveling issues. And those, how many have actually heard environments are not leveled? Environments are not leveled because they, this is happening in production, but it worked in UAT because they are not similar. And then we go into this loop of leveling the environment. We have to make the UAT environment similar to, or the staging environment similar to production. But in fact, if you are able to run a software on UAT environment, or a staging environment, it should run on production. That should be very straightforward. <coughs> so that culture is important, the continuous improvement culture. So we started to say, go beyond. You build it, you run it. You break it, you fix it. What I started saying to them, you touch it, you improve it. And this is very important, because in large organizations, you, are, you will have very less opportunity to build a software or, or build a solution from Greenfield or from scratch. You will have many solutions that exist that have to be extended. There are core systems that need to be extended. And if extension is required, you will be adding features. And if you are touching that feature or a particular part of the software, you have to improve it. Because anything around that boundary, if it breaks, the person who touch it is responsible for that. And if we, if we are able to to build that culture, it becomes easy, because then people start to improve. Because none of these software have any test coverage. So the onus on the developer was, if you are going to touch it, add any functionality, you are responsible to write test coverage. And then you have this beautiful heat map, where you can say that the test coverage is increasing in bubbles in the various sections, or places, or components. And then the software becomes, starts to improve and become better. When we started uh, uh, implementing DevOps, things started to fail. And they will fail. And I'm sure all of you in this room have experience when things fail, it becomes very hard to justify. Because especially to the senior leadership. Because for them, a running software all of a sudden started to break because a new way of development or deployment or automation was introduced. And that is the responsibility. That person who did that is responsible. So we had to break this culture of, or rather bring this culture, fail fast, fail cheap. Very easy to say, but then actually celebrating failures is very hard. You cannot stand in front of business and say, hey, I failed, let's celebrate. You're, they're not going to accept it. Their business is topsy-turvy. So they cannot basically say that because I'm introducing new way of working, things are failing apart or falling apart. So the culture of celebration or the culture of failing quite often is very important. So we started to reduce the cycle of going to production. Identify when you are in introducing automation, the sooner you go to production, the sooner you will identify the bottlenecks. And that becomes a very important part of 
automation. So we started doing this is a, a beautiful uh, concept, culture of post-mortem. How many of you actually do post-mortems when something goes wrong on production? What do you usually do? You find the problem, you fix the problem, and? Is it a question? Yeah. So then we have post-mortem meeting. Post-mortem meeting, we verify what happened, actually happened. Because uh, during the incident, it's uh, sometimes unclear, because several people, the developers fix code, uh, system can help or fix some systems and, and whatever, but after afterwards it's very important to verify what actually happened in, in all details. Correct. And then you can uh, have actions on that. Correct. And usually we forget to take actions because then there is next thing important is to deliver something else. So celebrating post-mortems becomes very important. In the bank, we have started to adopt this culture of celebrating post-mortems. So any incident that occurs on production, and there's a, the, the link at the bottom of the slide is, is, is how Google does post-mortem. That's a beautiful uh, template. You so, sort of, you can use the template for, for doing post-mortems. Because at the end of the day, if we are able to create this culture where the cost of failure is education, then you are into the game of building the culture in the organization, which is going to be basically change over a period of time. Culture is also about how the teams are organized. And Agile Scrum helped us, like I said. But culture is also about how, what is the work environment. In banks, typically, what you have is cubicles and cabins, where the managers are going to sit, and developers are also sitting in one corner, where there's a closed box. We broke that culture of having cubicles and cables. It's a completely flat structure. This is a new breed of bankers, which was quite fun because then bankers are typically behind, a teller is sitting behind a, a closed glass and you have to basically insert your hand and get some cash out. This is new breed of bankers, which, which is helping BTPN and its customers become digital. So when we started the journey, so let me go back a little uh, behind when we started. When we started, there are typically three approaches to the transformation that I have seen work pretty well. The third one does not, but let's see. The first one is the lab approach. What essentially it means is that you, create, you ring fence a small team, a cross-functional team, programmers, security people, QAs, sysadmin, operations guy. You ring fence a team. And you actually run the team to implement the whole chain of dev, uh, DevOps practices. And once the team is successful, then you start to scale. That's a lab approach. Second is a spike approach, where you actually pick up two to three teams and start implementing DevOps with those teams. The, the problem with this approach is, if the skill set is not there or people are not cross-functional, then the adoption becomes slow. And the final one, which is the easiest one, is the Big Bang approach. This is the most easiest one. There is a sarcasm there. It's the most toughest one, because you have to then design the whole DevOps org structure and then do a Big Bang. This is the most difficult to implement. And I have seen this to fail many, many a times. Because there will be a lot of disruption that is happening because of the, the expectation that this culture or this org structure is going to work in the organization. Because it has not been tried and tested. So we went ahead with option number one and two, a combination of both. Which is a lab and a spike. So we set up a team which is a cross-functional team. Programmers, SQO people, sysadmins, and operations. And we call themselves COPASUS. COPASUS is an Indonesian word. That means special commandos. They are on a special mission. And they, their mission was to actually start implementing DevOps practices. Now, when we started, we actually fought, uh, we, we, we started to put together objective with measurable goals. This is what 
Stephen was talking about story mapping yesterday, which is you have to put together your objectives, and objectives should be quarterly objectives. Typically, what we do is we put together a big plan and then start the execution. We said we will not put a, put a big plan. Let's put what we can achieve in next quarter. Put together a, a, our objectives, what we want to achieve, including uh, individual aspirations. So a programmer is aspiring to learn more on sysadmin. Sysadmin wants to become a programmer. So those aspirations were really good because then you are actually creating a cross-functional team. Once you have that, then you, have, then you create your backlog. This is a snapshot of uh, mission six for Copasus. So we, we were saying mission one, which is print one, or mission two, and stuff like that. So the missions were established, which is a bi-week, bi-weekly missions for the Copasus team. And they started to sprint, they learned, they stumbled, they got up, and they started to run. But when we started, uh, there are certain principles and practices that needs to be put in pl place. Bank has uh, SVN and IBM RTC as their source code or version control system. We started to say that we will use more modern way of control, uh, version control, which is Git. Now, if you, have, if you have been using SVN for a long time, you will have which, what I used to call is SVN mindset. You will start using Git as SVN. So you have to unlearn a lot of SVN behavioral patterns to start using Git. And that's where this manifesto become, became very important for us. We published this manifesto, manifesto and forced the developers to pledge to this manifesto, which means that if they are not following, following this manifesto, then they have to pay the penalty for it. Every team has CI-CD is very common. You basically create a CI-CD process. Uh, you have continuous integration and deployment and blah, blah, blah. What is important is when you set it up, are you religious about following these principles? Right? Uh, and that's part of the change of the culture. And I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, let me quickly explain some of the practices that are very salient to us. Um, you see this term, chakra. I'll talk about chakra as well. Uh, the pronunciation C is CH in Indonesia. That's why it's pronounced chakra, not kakra or sakra. Um, so some of the important uh, uh, salient things that were, uh, uh, which, we, which we held very strongly was you build once and you deploy multiple times. So this is very common, but practicing that is very important as well. We build once, which is you have a build cycle, and only once it gets built in a SIT environment. Beyond that, it gets promoted across multiple environments. You have, uh, uh, and, and that applies to any, any software whether it is a mobile app, or an API-driven backend app, or a web app. Doesn't matter, the principle applies the same. You build once, and you continue to promote across various environments. Sec second, which, was, uh, which became a little uh, challenging is, how do we, how do we manage the, the, the quality of our software? Most of the quality uh, parameters or tools that are there are cloud-based. So it, it was a little bit of challenge for us to use SonarCube and configure SonarCube because there are various ways to do that. Everyone knows about SonarCube, but how to use it efficiently, I don't think I have seen that work pretty well. We are able to get some uh, good quality attributes of, of a software, but we are still not there. What this process helped us was to go to production at any point that we want which is within 10 minutes from the developer machine to production, we are able to ship it. And here, OpenShift helped us a lot, because uh, not, I'm going to talk about the benefits of OpenShift, but it, it is easier to have a cloud-native solution where you don't need to worry about, especially the skill set that is needed to, to run a Kubernetes setup. Talking about Chakra, since we started implementing microservices in the bank, it becomes very challenging to know what version of microservice is deployed to what environment. At the same time, if microservice is being used or reused by various business units, which very soon started happen happening to us, that 
an identity management system developed by one team it will be reused by the bank. Now if that happens, there is a ver version that is maintained by the team. Now if it gets reused across, how do I know which team is using which version? Now this, all of the information is spread all, over, all across various systems. This was the first, and, and I, I, I must say, this was the first culture change that we started to see in the bank. No one asked the team that you need to know this. And Copasso's team felt that there is a need that we should know this. What version is deployed where? The information, information about the source of truth was in GitLab. The information about what is the version of the current build is in Nexus or Docker registry. What the information about the build pipeline for CD is with Jenkins, which, because Jenkins was the orchestrator for us. And actual truth of what version is deployed on production was in OpenShift. Which means that you have to collect all this information from various systems calling APIs, and then you have a dashboard which will say that this particular application, which is a project, has 16 microservices of this version. So that's where Chakra solved the problem, and the culture was there, people started to feel it, and they started, this is a homegrown product that we built for ourselves. The second thing that we saw, the pattern of, because we, were, we started to use OpenShift extensively in the bank, the adoption was very good, people loved it because then it decoupled the operations from, uh, from, from the, the operations of the sysadmins and brought it closer to the, to the developers because they were writing their Docker files. However, when we had set up OpenShift for the first time, it was a manual installation following the manual that we got from Red Hat. Which means that if you have to scale it, you have to keep on adding worker nodes. Adding a worker node on demand with a manual step is very difficult. Although it, is, it was not very complex, but it was very critical that we, we do the setup once again and now ansibilize that. So what the team did, which is another culture change, there was no need to do that, but they felt this is required because a lot of time is just wasted to create a node, add it to the cluster, and then run it. So they felt that we should, we should do it. So they learned Ansible. No one in the bank knew Ansible. So they learned Ansible. They, they wrote the playbook. And now in 30 minutes, they are able to set up OpenShift cluster across multiple uh, 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 data centers, including the, the network file sto storage that is all ansibilized. So that, that culture change brought a lot of shift towards people adopting automation. And this, this becomes crucial because then you, then you started to see the patterns that I want to write more automation on the tests because only then you can be fast. So we started creating this culture that you have to have unit tests, you have to have functional tests. You need to test your APIs, because with microservices, you have all, the only thing that you have is APIs. You need to test the customer journey for those APIs. You need to have performance and security test as a feature, not something that happens towards the release times that you have to do VA and, and pen tests and everything. We, 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 made, we started to make sure that they, these NFRs, non-functional requirements, became a feature for the stories or as part of definition of done. To, to, to make sure that we are not losing on the rhythm, we, st we also started to have these weekly dashboards, a visual performance dashboards, which are very critical from a management perspective because for them is how do I know that it is working? So we started to have these visual dashboards which clearly says that, hey, the code quality, C GPA is dropping or going up from the previous print, or the API test coverage has dropped, it's so, so buckle up, you have to uh, take care of that. Other aspect that becomes uh, important is monitoring. Like Andrew was talking in the morning about how should we monitor a system. There is no, there is no single tool that I have uh, personally not seen a single tool that is so efficient that it helps you to monitor, especially with microservices. And add to the icing on the cake when, when microservices are not orchestrated, but they are choreographed, which means they're completely asynchronous. It became, it became so much painful for us to understand 
and map it to the customer journey. For a customer journey to work efficiently, you need to know what microservices are doing what and where, in which message queue, where are the topics, and whether they are actually functioning the way they are supposed to function. So it's extremely important that you need to start building those constructs because all the person who knows the most about is the developer. Your ops guy are not going to know because they have no freaking clue where it broke and what queue has the message that is required for a service to pick it up. So we started creating these monitoring and performance dashboards, including operational dashboards. Because it's a bank, you will definitely not have the full flexibility to run the software or access to production. There will be some operation people who are going to be involved in this whole running the software. So operational dashboards became the responsibility of the devs. They need to create these dashboards, which is the services need to know how I'm working, the health check. Um, the final thing, which is to keep track of the DevOps transition. This becomes extremely important. And what I have seen in my experience, a lot of the organizations, what they do is they cherry pick. They pick the ones that works for them and leave, leave the stuff that is very difficult to implement. So this is crucial that we, that we have the, a, a snapshot to show the practices that are required to, to implement DevOps in the organization and where do we stand. This is a snapshot of where we stand most of it, but we are lagging behind on a lot of stuff. So this is a journey that we are taking. We are still far away from saying that we are a DevOps organization, but we, the, the journey and the culture is changing, mindset is changing, people are starting to adopt new way of working, new tools, because in banks people are always scared. If I take this open source tool, I will implement it. But where is the enterprise license for this? Who is the ringable neck if something breaks? I need to go and grab someone. And that person has to come and fix it. That's a culture that I have seen in large in enterprises, including banks. And people who work in banks can basically, I see people nodding their head because that they have experienced it. There is, for any product or solution that, that enterprises use, there is always someone which is holding the enterprise license. Because if something breaks, then I need to catch someone. So we are on that journey. I would like to end the session with uh, this beautiful uh, statement. The most important is the, the, the last sentence. DevOps isn't something you can buy. It's something you have to do. And the most important part is you have to do it yourself. Typically, enterprises, you will find out someone who will come and implement DevOps for you. But that does not work. Then that culture will not be there. You have to build that culture. And building that culture requires that you do the DevOps yourself. Why, uh, there's the last slide that, uh, which when I was uh, um, having coffee in the morning, uh, I read it on Twitter. This is a beautiful statement. Now, computer shall not harm your work or through inaction allow your work to come to harm. So it's all about people. It's all about mindset. That's all I had. Thank you very much. And yes, BTPN is hiring. If you all are interested, then we can chat offline. Thank you.